Microservices seem to be the endless source of inspiration for videos, materials, and so on and so forth. And that's no surprise, given that they are extremely popular. Most of us are writing new applications to be microservices. Many of us are splitting our monoliths into smaller pieces, which end up being microservices. And many of us are facing issues when working with microservices because, let's face it, there are benefits, but there are also challenges that we need to solve when working with microservices. Now, this video is not about microservices. I will not tell you how to create your applications to be microservices. I will not give you the overview of benefits of using microservices. I will not speak about challenges with microservices and so on and so forth. And the reason why I'm not going to do that is because you already know those things. You know the basics because you're watching this channel and you saw this video over there that I published a while ago. This video is about communication between applications. And the more applications we have, the more important it is how we organize that communication. Hence, it matters more for microservices than monoliths, simply because with microservices we have more of them. And then communication can get easily very, very messy, very complex, very ineffective, and so on and so forth. Now, even though I said that I will not speak about microservices and monoliths in general terms, I still need to provide a short intro because that will be important for communication subject that I will speak about in a few seconds. So let's start with monoliths. Monoliths are big applications, huge applications. And since they are huge, then we have many people working on monoliths, right? Uh, the teams working on a monolith that include developers and testers and operations and so on and so forth can be anything between one or two people until hundreds or even thousands of people. So big application with many people working on that application. Now that really does not matter in this context what does matter is communication. We have functions within those monoliths or classes or whatever is the way you organize code in your application that depends on the language. But anyways, I will call it functions, right? So you have function here, function here, 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 and here. And then the communication goes within the same process, right? So we have in-process communication, function one calls, function two, function three, works with function four, and so on and so forth. So all the communication is done with in the application. It does not go outside. It does not use networking to communicate between different functions because they're all together in the same binary. Now, microservices are different because there's many of them. We have one, two, three, four, 10, 100,000 small applications and they're managed by small teams because small applications need small teams. Normally you have a team of one, two, three, maybe six. Six would be probably the maximum amount of maximum number of people in charge of each of those small applications. Sometimes a single team could manage two or three or four microservices, depending on how small they are and how we organize those microservices. However, what matters here is that they are separate applications and communication needs to go through HTTP or through some other protocol, but communication goes through networking. So application one can talk with application two and application two with applications three and four, and the communication can go back and forth between those applications and so on and so forth. It can get messy, but the alternative to that can be a central place. So instead of applications communicating with each other directly and trying to figure out where they are and waiting for each other, we can be sending messages to one place and applications could be subscribing to those messages to receive the information that they need about the events or whatever else might be happening in the system. Now let's talk about communication protocols. And from certain point of view, we can divide them into two groups. They can be synchronous and asynchronous. Synchronous communication means that when we send a request to an application, we are waiting for the response. And that means that we need to wait for that response, that we are blocked, or at least that the process, one of the processes of an application are blocked until the response is received. 
or it could be asynchronous. We can just send a request somewhere to somebody, to something, and then forget about it. And if that somebody or that something needs to communicate back to us, then that something will send us request directly or indirectly. So protocols can be synchronous or asynchronous. Let's go through synchronous protocols first, very briefly. So application one would send a request to application two and wait for the response. That's what makes it synchronous. It is waiting until the response is received. A typical example of a synchronous protocol would be HTTP REST, let's say. Now, the fact that synchronous requests are synchronous by design does not mean that you need to use them synchronously. You can send a request to an application without waiting for response. So the fact that protocol is synchronous does not mean that you need to use it synchronously. It can be async. You can implement your application in a way that it sends a request and does not wait for a response. Now, one thing, important thing about synchronous types of protocols is that you need to know the destination. You need to know where you're sending your requests. Where is that application that should receive it? Now, that might sound trivial, but you'll see later when we scale to more than two, three, four, five applications, how that can become very messy very fast. Asynchronous protocols, on the other hand, would be those like AMQP, MQTT, and STOMP, let's say. And given that they are asynchronous by nature, the goal is to send the request and forget about it. Like, hey, here's what I did, or hey, this is what I would like to be the new state of a system or whatever other type of message we want to send. And typically, we would use a broker for that. We would send a message to a broker and say, hey, I sent my intention, this is what I want, and I do not know who will receive it, why somebody should receive it, who is listening to it, and so on and so forth. Now, we can obviously send asynchronous messages directly to consumers, but more often than not, we are talking about brokers or message queues or even buses as central locations to where we are sending those messages. So the important thing to understand with brokers is that we do not need to worry about destinations. We do not need to think about, hey, who should receive this message, where that something is and so on and so forth. We just send a message and forget about it. We can also divide communication into receivers. Is it a single receiver or multiple receivers? Is there a situation where application one is sending requests only and exclusively to application two, or there is a chain? Maybe application one sends to application two, and application two sends to applications three and four, and application five is there involved, and all that communication is to send messages back to origins and so on and so forth. So there could be a single receiver, or there could be multiple receivers. And when it's multiple receivers, it has to be asynchronous. I mean, it doesn't have to be async. It could be synced, but then you're going to have real and terrible performance issues because then you need to wait for the whole chain to respond back to you and so on and so forth. So even though you could implement multi-receiver architecture synchronously, you do not want to do that. So I will ignore the fact that you can do it and say, no, you can't, don't do it. So if you have multiple receivers, it needs to be async, at least if you care about performance. And if you do not want to have too much trouble about figuring out who does what and how and when, and if you don't want to introduce too much dependencies between microservices because, well, then they are not microservices. So when we have multiple receivers, the number of those receivers can be anything between zero and any number, infinite number. We do not know that in advance, we do not care about who is receiving messages. So maybe it's nobody, maybe it's somebody, maybe it's something, maybe there are many processes receiving it, we do not care. Instead, we focus on event-driven architecture. We are sending events somewhere to a message broker or something similar to that. We just send a request and forget about it. And then there are other processes that might, and I repeat, might, they don't have to, but they might be listening for messages and then doing something. So typically, applications would be either sending messages to brokers or listening to messages from other applications or doing more often than not both. So it could be something like, hey, 
this guy just chose to uh, put this something to a shopping cart and then some other application, other microservice figures out, hey, oh, somebody put something in a shopping cart, I should update my records over here. And then some third application would say, hey, that means that I should do this as well, and so on and so forth. So we have an event created by a single application, and then we have zero or more other applications that are listening for that type of event and doing something, whatever they think they should be doing. Now, from microservices perspective, none of those things matter. You do not care much what is a broker, where is it, and so on and so forth. All you care about is to know a single destination for communication. This is the destination where you send messages, and this is the source that you listen for events. Who generates events? Well, you do not care about that. You just care about event types and trying to filter out which ones you're interested in and which ones you do not care about. The important thing to understand here is that synchronous calls are not resilient. A failure of a single piece of a system can bring the whole system down. All the applications are depending on all other applications. And on top of that, synchronous messaging is not performant for the same reason why they are not resilient, because we need to wait for responses from all those applications. We need to block processes, we need to block threads, and so on and so forth. Asynchronous calls are the opposite especially when we're using message brokers. They're resilient because they do not depend on availability of other services, of other applications. And most of the time, they depend on a message broker, whatever that broker is. And there are many solutions that can serve as message brokers or even sources or whatever we use there in a center. Now, all this time, I probably sounded as if I'm saying, hey, synchronous communication is always direct communication and the synchronous communication is always indirect through message brokers, but that's not really what I'm trying to say. You can, without any doubt, implement asynchronous messaging without message brokers. You can send a request to one application, two applications, three other applications, and you do not need to wait for responses. And those same applications can send requests back to you, again, without waiting for responses. And you have asynchronous communication, but that is very, very, very inefficient. That's too chatty. There are too many things connecting with each other. And each of the applications need to know of the existence and location of all the other applications that they need to communicate with. So even though asynchronous communication can be direct, do not do it. Please, 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 please do not do that. Please do not uh, use direct communication. If you can avoid it, use message brokers. That might not be appropriate if you have only one or two or three applications, but the moment you scale, you need some sort of events. You need a single place where you can send requests and single place that you can listen for events, for messages. And that way you will implement asynchronous communication. You will avoid uh, coupling applications between each other's. They will be truly independent. They will be truly microservices. Because from that moment on, if there is a message broker, none of the services care about other services. They only care about listening for certain types of events and sending their own information to the broker. So how does that broker thing look like? Well, imagine having, let's say, three applications. Normally you would have 30 or 300 applications, but for the purpose of this talk, let's say that we have three applications, one, two, three. And then we can use either messaging or eventing. Messaging would be something like, hey, I would like to do this and that. I want this. And then some other application, let's say application three would say, let me do that. I just received the information that you want to do something and I'm in charge of doing that something and I will do that. So let me do that. So think of it as I want to do something and let me do that. That could be done by one application or two applications or five applications or none of the applications. That depends how many of them are listening for that specific type of messages. Now, instead of sending messages, we can send events. And that is even better way of thinking about it, potentially a better way to do all this, to organize this type of communication. Events would be, hey, I just did this. This is what I did. I do not know who wants to do something. I do not want to do anything. I'm just telling you that this is what I just did. And then some other applications listening for events 
are saying, well, no, I'm not going to do anything. Or something like, hey, that means that I should do this because he just did that, therefore I must be doing this. And this is even better. Events are better than messages because events provide real decoupling. I'm not telling you what you should do because if I need to tell you what you should do, even when we are going through message brokers, I'm somehow coupling myself with you. If instead I just send an event, hey, this is what I did, I do not know who should do something with that something, then we are having real decoupling. So events are the way to go if we want to have decoupled applications. Now, architecturally, it's more or less the same. We are always sending messages to message brokers or event stores or whatever we are using as a central database for messages or events. The difference is not that much architectural or that much in a way how we write code, but more in a way how we are expressing ourselves. We can send commands like I want this or we can just say what we did and then let others figure out whether they should do something with it. So synchronous communication through brokers can be either through messages or through events. If you have to choose one over the other, events should be the default choice. And if you do all that, if you have events floating into brokers, into some central storages, and if you have applications listening for those events, then we have truly decoupled architectures. None of the applications know about the existence of the rest of the applications. None of them need to think about the locations of other applications and what they do and where they are and so on and so forth all that all the applications need to know about is the location of a message broker or even source. A good example of such type of architecture would be Kubernetes itself. We have a cluster and we have Kube API. And when we send requests to Kube API, we are expressing the desired state. We're not telling Kubernetes what to do, or at least we shouldn't be telling Kubernetes what to do, even though we could. But most of the time, we are expressing the desired state, what we want to have eventually, somehow. And then Kubernetes API is not doing anything inside of the cluster. Kubernetes API is publishing those events, and then we have different controllers in a cluster listening for certain event types. And when an event is created, if that event matches what the controller is listening for, the controller creates a resource. That resource could be a deployment, and then some other controller might be listening for the events from the deployment and create replica set, and then some third controller would listen for those events and create pods, and one resource could be created by one controller, but then it could be updated by another controller. We do not really know how all that will happen. As a user, we just say, hey, this is the desired state I want to have, and I do not care about anything else. It's a job of those controllers to listen to those desires and figure out whether there is something they should or shouldn't do. Now comes the important question that you might be asking yourself or you want to ask me, and that's, hey, how do I implement such an architecture? How do I implement uh, events or messaging? How, how can I make it all asynchronous? How can I make it easy and microservice friendly? And the answer to that question is, not in this video. One of the upcoming videos will go into implementation of such architecture, how we can accomplish what I just explained in theory through real tools, through a real demo, through practical step-by-step -step instructions. So stay tuned, that's coming very, very soon.